welcome back to the JFK assassination audit uh, video number 44 and it is 18 January we're gonna keep going down this uh, timeline and we were talking about Lenny Mae Randall and how she had uh, been written up in a report by an uh, FBI agent book out is saying the package that Oswald was carrying was 42 inches, uh, three, three and a half feet long is what the agent put down. Um, but in numerous other statements, the Warren Commission video statement, she always says it was 27 inches, which goes, jives right along with what uh, her brother Will Frazier was saying, was 24 inches. It also goes exactly long with the measurements that we did with Oswald from his, uh, underneath his upper arm to the fingertips, which is exactly the way that Will Frazier said Oswald was carrying the uh, the package. All right, so we're gonna try to find out some more about Bookout. Uh, we had read some stuff about him, and now we're gonna read some statements that he's produced or or put out, and see how those jive with the facts that other people are saying in other statements. Let's see if he is consistent or if he changes things. So it says, Lee Harvey Oswald, um, 1026 North Beckley, Dallas, Texas, was interviewed by Captain Will Fritz of the Homicide Bureau, Dallas Police Department. Special Agents James P. Hosty Jr. and James W. Bookout were present during the interview. When the agents entered the interview room at 3.15 p.m., so remember this is, although this is report is being filed at on the 23rd, which is a Saturday, Oswald's arrested on the 22nd, about 1.50 in the afternoon. So Oswald's been in this interrogation room. He got there a little bit after 2. So he's probably been there a little bit over an hour. So it says, Captain Wilfritz has been previously interviewing Lee Harvey Oswald for an undetermined period of time. Both agents identified themselves to Oswald and advised him they were law enforcement officers and anything he said could be used against them. Now this is before Miranda also. Um, Oswald at this time adopted a violent attitude toward the FBI and both agents um, and made uncomplimentary remarks about the FBI. Now, it could be they're making that up, that Bookout's trying to show the instability of Oswald, uh, but we also have other statements uh, from other officers that were in the uh, interview and said Oswald wasn't too happy the FBI was there. Okay, and uh, anyway, we'll keep going. So it says, and also, if you think about it, if Oswald, okay, we'll, we'll do the two scenarios here. So we got Oswald, the uh, crazy, lone nut, socialist, angry socialist, communist, revolutionary. So this attitude would be consistent with someone like that, okay? But like I said, I don't buy that's how he really is. I'm, I'm leaning more towards he's working undercover for somebody. Now, if you're a right-wing conservative, anti-government uh, type of person, you're probably going to, you know, not have a healthy attitude towards the FBI. But also, if you're an undercover informant for these same guys, book out or hosty, to cover your ass... You're going to act hostile toward them, okay? So you're still building your legend, and this way it doesn't put them at risk of, you know, being part of the plot here. Anyway, we'll keep going. Let's see. Oswald requested that Captain Fritz remove the cuffs from him. It had been noted that Oswald had handcuffed, was handcuffed with his hands behind him. Captain Fritz had one of his detectives remove the handcuffs and handcuff Oswald with his hands in front of him. Uh, Captain Fritz asked Oswald if he ever owned a rifle, and Oswald stated that he had observed Mr. Truly, uh, a supervisor at the Texas School Book Depository on November 20th, 1963, display a rifle uh, to some individuals in his office on the first floor of the Texas School Book Depository, but denied he ever, but denied ever owning a rifle himself. Now, that's interesting that they would mention that first, and Oswald would say that first, okay? sort of as a distraction. Um, if you remember, truly, uh, there was this other employee, or not employee, but person that worked in the Texas School Book Depository, but not for the Texas School Book Depository, uh, that bought a rifle downtown 
during lunch, brought it back. This was on the 20th, about two days before, and brought it to Mr. Truly, was showing him, and uh, he was just playing it. So somehow Oswald must have been passing by Mr. Truly's office and saw this rifle, which happened to turn out to be a Mauser, a 6.5 Mauser. Uh, but it's interesting, Oswald denied he ever owned a rifle. Um, that, I find that interesting. But anyway, so Oswald stated that he had never been in Mexico except to Tijuana on one occasion. He would have done that in the Marines, of course. However, he admitted to Captain Fritz th to have resided in the Soviet Union for three years where he was has many friends and relatives of his wife. All right, let's see what else here. Oswald also admitted that he was the secretary for the Fair Play for Cuba committee in New Orleans, Louisiana, a few months ago. Uh, Oswald stated that the Fair Play for Cuba committee has its headquarters in New York City. Oswald admitted to having received an award for the marksmanship while a member of the U.S. Marine Corps. Now, why would he admit to being in the Fair Play for Cuba committee when he's really the only member? That's interesting. Uh, he further admitted that he was living at 1026 North Beckley in Dallas, Texas, under the name of O.H. Lee. Um, now, it's interesting that you'll read that Oswald said that he had said his name was Lee Harvey Oswald and that the lady had got it mixed up and called him O.H. Lee, so he just kept going with that. Anyway, Oswald admitted that he was present in the Texas School Book Depository on November 22, 1963, where he's been employed ever since October 15th, uh, 1963. Oswald stated that he was a laborer. Uh, he has access to the entire building, which has offices on the first and second floor. Now, you see how he says it's October 15th? Well, Oswald was in Mexico on the 5th or 6th and came back. I believe he arrived back on the 7th, so it's not like he was going weeks and months uh, being unemployed. He was also getting unemployment. All right, this is Hosty and Bookout. So that's the one of their statements there. Let's see, hold on one second. All right, so this is a continuation of that original statement. Uh, floors and on the third and fourth as well as the fifth and sixth floors. Ozzel stated that he went to lunch approximately noon, and he claimed he ate his lunch on the first floor in the lunchroom. However, he went to the second floor where the Coca-Cola machine was located and obtained a bottle of Coke for his lunch. Oswald claimed to be on the first floor when President John F. Kennedy uh, passed this building. Now, see, there's another verification, okay, that Oswald wasn't on the sixth floor, okay? So, why would Oswald say this, okay, if no one saw him, okay? And another thing is, why would, we're going to read the statements from some other people, these other people say that they saw him on the second floor, the first and the second floor, okay, if he didn't do those things and he was on the sixth floor. So how could he be on the sixth floor when we've got, he's telling book out, he's on the first and second floor, uh, Baker, and truly confront him on the second floor with a cook cold machine, just like he said. Another lady passes him in the second floor lunchroom, just like you said, another one passes him. On, we got two other ones that pass him on the first floor, just like you said, in the lunchroom there. So, again, with no fingerprints on the rifle, no uh, paraffin, no excuse me, no uh, gunpowder residue on his face, and then you got one, two, three, three to four people saying he was on the second floor. Then you got an FBI agent reporting what Oswald told them confirming what everyone else has said. So Oswald wasn't on that damn second, uh, sixth floor, shooting at the president. After hearing what happened, he said that because of all the confusion, there would be no work performed that afternoon, so he decided to go home. Oswald stated that he went home by bus and changed his clothes and went to a movie. Oswald admitted to carrying a pistol with him to the movie, stating he didn't did this because he felt like it, giving no other reason. Oswald further admitted attempting to fight the Dallas police officers who arrested him in the movie theater when he received a cut and a bump. So we'll go back here. Let's see. Now, there were other people that went home. 
Now, it's been reported by Truly and other people saying that there weren't other people that went home, but there were other people that went home. There were other people that weren't with the Texas School Book Depository that went home also. Okay, There were other people that were outside the building that couldn't get back in, and so they decided to go home. And let's see. Let's see. Dun, dun, dun. He said that he rode a bus. It's interesting. He didn't mention the taxi cab. Uh, maybe he was just... Maybe they... Maybe you mentioned that. See, that's the thing. When you have someone taking down what someone said, unless they read it and sign for it, you don't know if they took down everything they said. Okay. He obviously didn't change his clothes because he still had on the same T-shirt and the shirt. All he did was put on a jacket, which would make sense because it's November. Said he was carrying a pistol, and again, you gotta under, you gotta ask yourself, if you're gonna go shoot the president of the United States and you're gonna shoot him on the sixth floor with a rifle that's bolt action, you got six floors to go down to escape, and you can see the police are running by right there in front of you. Don't you think you would have taken a pistol in case you had to shoot your way out? But Oswald goes home and gets the pistol. Okay. So that tells you that Oswald knew people were hunting for him. Okay, He knew the fix was in, something was wrong. The president didn't get warned or the assassination wasn't stopped like he was told it was going to happen. Something happened that was different than what he'd expected to happen. Okay, And think about it. Isn't it odd that Oswald is one of the few people that's inside the building and not outside watching the assassination. Isn't that odd? Anyway, let's see. Yeah, he admitted to fighting with the police officers. Well, I would too if you thought that, you know, that Tippett was a corrupt cop and was going to try to kill you and you just shot him or you knew the police would probably be chasing you. Okay. I'd probably fight them too. Anyway, Oswald frantically denied shooting police officer Tippett or shooting President John F. Kennedy. The interview was concluded at 4.05 p.m. when Oswald was removed for lineup. It's only 45 minutes. Wow. Uh, all right. We'll go to the next one here. All right, this is the Federal Bureau of Investigation on the 25th. This is typed up on the 25th. So that would have been Monday after Oswald is shot. So they typed all these up after Oswald is shot. Lee Harvey Oswald was interviewed at the Homicide Bureau. Uh, let's see, President Special Agent Bookout. Oswald is advised of, ident ad advised of the identity and official capacity of said agent and the fact that he did not make... Wait a minute. Oswald was advised of the identity and official capacity of said agent and the fact that he did not make any statement that any statement he did make could be used in a court of law against him and that any statement made must be free and voluntary and that he had the right to consult with an attorney. See, that's the one thing I don't understand is that if I was Oswald... I wouldn't have said a fucking thing. I would have just sat there and say, I want an attorney. I want an attorney. I'm taking the fifth. I want an attorney. I wouldn't have said a damn thing. Anyway. But to me, that that goes to the ability that he was panicking because he didn't know what was going on. He knew something went on, and they were trying to pin it on him, but he didn't know how it happened. That's what it says to me is that that's why he's fervently defending himself in front of the police. Anyway, any good lawyer is going to tell you never, ever, ever, ever talk to the police. Never. Unless you're being a, you know, Johnny B. Good, good citizen. But if they're using you, if they've got you questioning as a suspect, never, never talk to the police. Because they're going to use everything you say against you. Okay? And they're going to twist it. And they can come back and confuse you. So just never talk to a police. Always talk to an attorney. 
It says Oswald stated that he did not own any rifle. He advised that he saw a rifle the day uh, before yesterday at the Texas School Book Depository with Mr. Truly and two other gentlemen had in their possession and were looking at. Oswald stated on the November 22nd at the time of the search of the Texas School Book Depository building of the Dallas Police Office, he was on the second floor of said building having just purchased a Coca-Cola from the soft drink machine, at which time a police officer came in the room with a pistol drawn and asked him if he worked there. Mr. Mr. Truly was present and verified that he was an employee and that the police officer thereafter left the room and continued through the building. Oswald stated that he took his Coke down the first floor and stood around and had lunch at the employee's lunch room. He therefore went outside and stood around for five or ten minutes with foreman Bill Shelley and thereafter went home. He stated that he left work because, in his opinion, based on the remarks of Bill Shelley, he did not believe that there was going to be any work that day to the confusion of the building. He stated after arriving at his residence that he went to a movie where he was subsequently apprehended by the Dallas Police Department. All right. So, <clears throat> again, we're just going to replay that. 90 seconds after the the Kennedy is shot, after the last sh you know shots are fired, somehow Oswald wiped his fingerprints off the rifle, off the scope, off the shells, ran over to the opposite side of the building where the staircase was, hid the rifle without putting his fingerprints back onto the rifle, ran down the stairs past Victoria Adams, okay, who was going down the stairs from the fourth floor at the same time. She didn't see him. Ran into the, uh, the uh, second floor lunchroom, fumbled for his change, put it into the Coke machine, got a Coke, came back out, okay, and was drinking the Coke within 90 seconds after Mr. Truly and Officer Baker ran up the stairs and saw him in the second floor lunchroom. Quite interesting. How could he do that? And then he's saying here that he went downstairs, finished his lunch, and then went outside, hung out with Bill Shelley. Now, if you had just killed the police, uh, if you had just killed the President of the United States, don't you think you would have brought your your pistol? Don't you think you would have not finished your lunch in the first floor lunchroom, especially if you just saw a policeman? And then also, don't you think you wouldn't have been hanging out with somebody for five or ten minutes? You'd be getting the hell out of Dodge, okay? Which all this makes sense now with Frazier because Frazier said that he went down Elm Street a little bit towards the railroad tracks. He came back, stood on the Texas School Book Depository, uh, front steps, the officer came by him, then he came back down to Houston and Elm, hung out there with about five or ten minutes or so, and then Oswald comes round the back, off the loading dock, up Houston, walks past him on to, over to Elm, and goes up Elm Street. This is exactly what Oswald just said he did. Anyway, let's see what else we got here. Oswald stated that uh, his hours at work at the Texas School Depository were 8 a.m. to 4.45, but that he is not required to punch a time clock. He usually, his usual place of work in the building is on the first floor. However, he frequently is required to go to the 4th, 5th, 6th floor, and 7th floors of the building in order to get books. And there's book out again. And you see this? Look at that. So, book out is dictating this again on the from a conversation on the 22nd, dictating on the 24th, and then typing it up and sending it out on the 25th. I guess there was no rush after Oswald was is killed. All right, let's take a look at the next one. This is top secret. I don't know why it would be top secret. All right, hold on a second. There's a top secret statement here. Hold on.
All right, so we're going to read uh, FBI agent James Bookout's Warren Commission testimony. Okay, this was taken on April 8th, 1964, and right there at the federal courthouse or the federal building in Irvine and Irve Streets in Dallas. It says, we'll skip this other part here. We'll get down to the meat of it. Hold on one second. It says, were you on duty on November 22nd? Uh, Mr. Bookout, actually, I was on leave on that particular date. However, I had, uh, however, I had been requested to come to the office to handle some expedited dictation in a particular case. Having completed that, I left the office and proceeded to the Mercantile National Bank, where I transacted some personal business. Upon leaving the bank, it was momentarily expected that the president's motorcade would pass that area. I stood there for a few minutes. And as the motorcade passed, I actually was unable to personally observe the president due to the crowd on the sidewalk. While waiting for the crowd to thin in order to cross the street, several separate sirens of the police squad cars were heard proceeding in the direction of the county courthouse. While crossing the street, some citizens with transistor radio say they had just been announced that shots had been fired at the president's motorcade. I find it interesting that you got the President of the United States coming to your town, and I'm sure the FBI office in Dallas wasn't a huge office, maybe 20 people at the most, 30 people. But yet, one of the agents is able to conduct personal business, take a day off, all this kinds of thing, even though he was available to work the crowds, do something. Anyway, I found that a waste of resources. It says, I immediately proceeded towards the office and observed two agents coming from the direction of the office who advised that the office was trying to contact me and I was to proceed to Homicide and Robbery Bureau of the Dallas Police Department. I immediately proceeded to the Homicide and Robbery Bureau and contacted my office and was advised that I was to maintain liaison with the Homicide and Robbery Bureau. Uh, did you then go to the police headquarters? Yes. As I said, I went to the Homicide and robbery bureaus after contacting the police office uh, the Dow contacting the Dallas office um, what then occurred at the police headquarters uh, let me ask you this how soon after you arrive there was Oswald brought in well it was wait a minute so why was he asked to go to homicide and robbery bureau to liaison between the Dallas police and the FBI if they hadn't had a suspect yet. That's interesting. Um, well, it was it was some little time, as I recall, the next pertinent instance was the report that the Dallas police officer had been shot and that was in Oak Cliff area. Captain Fritz had not returned to the office at that time. When did when he did return and subsequently Oswald was apprehended in the Texas theater information was passed to Captain Fritz at the as to the name of the suspect and that, that they had apprehended on the Tippett shooting and at that time he stated that was the suspect that they were looking for in the killing of the president huh how would they know that that's interesting how would Fritz know that the same person that shot Tippett shot the president? Anyway, did the name Lee Harvey Oswald mean anything to you at that time? No. That's odd because you got a host of your boy going over there knocking on his wife's door. And then Oswald had left a nasty note a couple of weeks before. Anyway, no, Captain Fritz went on to explain Oswald was an employee of the Texas School Book Depository who uh, they had ascertained left his employment there subsequent to the shooting. And sometime after that, wait, hold on one second. And sometime after that was brought to the police headquarters. Uh, yes. Were you present when he was brought in? Yes. Can you describe his physical condition? Um, I can recall one of the officers that brought him in was Paul Bentley. He is a uh, polygraph operator in the Identification Bureau of the Dallas Police Department and Bentley was limping and Oswald had one eye that was swollen and scratch marked on his forehead. 
Did you observe any bruises? None. Uh, was he handcuffed? Yes. Was he walking by himself or being held by the police officers? To my recollection, there was an officer on each side of him that had a hold of his arms. Was he struggling? No. Just walking uh, in, you know what I mean? Yes, in a formal fashion. Then what occurred that you observed? Now, we'll get into this later, but I, I wanted to say something about Oswald's resistance to the police at the Texas School Book Depository. I mean, excuse me, at the Texas Theater. So, I think of it like this. If you know that the police are probably in on the fix and that, you know, you, you they've cornered you and you're thinking the jig is up, they're pro you, you're thinking they're probably going to kill you right there and then say that you resisted or pulled a gun or something like that. And another interesting thing is that if Oswald did pull the gun, okay, why were his fingerprints not on that, <laughs> not on the handgun either? <laughs> they couldn't find any fingerprints of Oswald on the handgun that he supposedly pulled on the police officers, okay? So I, I do find that interesting. Although he admitted to having the handgun. And it's interesting that he admitted to having the handgun, but not the rifle. Anyway. I mean, if you're going to admit to the handgun, why not admit to the rifle? Anyway. I believe he was taken directly into Captain Fritz's office, and the interview started at the time with Captain Fritz and the two homicide officers. Were you present? I was not in the office at the time. I called our office, advised him that he had been brought in and that the interview was starting. And shortly thereafter, Mr. Shanklin, Shanklin, our SAC, called back and said that the Bureau wanted the agents present in the interview and that Hosty, James P. Hosty, and I, um, I believe, was to sit in on the interview. And I was also, I was to also be present with Hosty. So at the time, we asked Captain Fritz to sit in on the interview, and that was approximately 3.15. So that's interesting. So he's already there at the Homicide and Robbery Bureau, okay? Oswald's brought in about 2 o'clock, and immediately brought to Captain Fritz's office to be interviewed, but the FBI doesn't go in until 3.15, almost an hour later. Why would that be, I wonder? Anyway. How long had the interview gone on? See, there we go. How long had the interview gone on before you were present? Very shortly. I would give a rough estimate not more than five or ten minutes at the most. Now, wait a minute. I believe that he was taken directly into Captain Fritz's office, and the interview started at that time with Captain Fritz and the two homicide officers. Now, let's go back. Oswald's arrested at about 1.50, 1.55 at the Texas Theater. Okay, it takes five minutes to get him into the car. It takes five, maybe ten minutes at the most to drive from Oak Cliff to downtown. Maybe five more minutes to park. So you've got 2.15, 2.20. Okay. And... So he's saying they didn't get there until they got there at 3.10, 3.05. So what was going on for almost 45 minutes? Where was Oswald for almost 45 minutes from the Texas theater to <laughs> this interview with Fritz? That's weird. Very strange. Hold on one second. All right, we'll keep going. Let's see, 3.15. How long did the first interview last? A little under an hour. Uh, was it interrupted at any point, if you remember? Well, what I am thinking, we have got several interviews here. I know from time to time, I can't recall whether it was the interview or subsequent interviews. Captain Fritz, 
I mean, that's kind of odd, don't you think? That they can't remember. Um, you know, how many policemen have you seen that have little notepads that write down freaking, you know, like everything? I, it doesn't take much that when you go in there and sit down, you write down the date, you write down the time, and then you just write down anything that Oswald says uh, of importance. And then the next time you're interviewing, you write down the date, you write down the time, you write down whatever Oswald says of importance. But here we, are, here we have a skilled, trained, you know, FBI agent. He's been an FBI agent for 20-something years that can't remember one interview from the next or the times or anything like that. That's kind of strange. You know, again, if we had gotten a trial for Oswald, okay, and then put him up on, you know, put book out up on the stand, cross-examined him, and questioned him by a defense attorney, they would have ripped him to shreds. How do you even know what Oswald said? You can't remember any times? Can't remember what was said when? Very strange. A good, a good defense attorney would have ripped book out to shreds on the on the uh, witness stand and we he would have had no credibility with the jury by the time that he had finished with him anyway by office I mean the immediate office that the interview was being conducted in but still within the homicide and robbery office did the interviewing uh, continue when he was out of the room or did you wait for his return? No, it would continue. Okay, so this is Fritz he's talking about leaving. Uh, by whom was the interview conducted? Primarily it was conducted by Captain Fritz. And then before he would leave from one point to another, he would ask if there was anything we wanted to ask him in particular on that point. By we, you mean agent hosting yourself? Right. What was Oswald's demeanor in the course of this interview? Did he seem in control of himself, excited to come? Can you describe his conduct? He was very arrogant and argumentative. That is about the extent of the comment on that. Well, you know, if you think about it, if you're pretty damn sure you didn't fucking shoot the president and you didn't do what they said you said that they did, you didn't do what they are trying to say that you did, I'd be pretty fucking arrogant and argumentative also. If you're defending your life and you're too ignorant enough to know you need a fucking lawyer, that's what someone would do. No, I wouldn't. I was in the fucking first floor eating my lunch and I was on the second floor getting a Coke. I wasn't on the sixth floor shooting the president. What are you, crazy? I'd be pretty fucking argumentative myself. if you Because you know... Shooting the president, Capitol Finch, probably going to get electric chair in, in uh, Texas. So I'd be pretty fucking argumentative. I mean, I, I wouldn't just be sitting there going, uh-huh, oh, I don't know, officer, what do you think? You know, I wouldn't be a Will Frazier. Even Will Frazier was willing to fight the police, you know, when they said shit that he didn't agree with. Now, is Will Frazier a fucking crazy communist? You know, we're gonna, we heard Will Frazier say that you know, uh, was it Captain Fritz? Yeah, Captain Fritz put a, f a statement saying that he was part of the conspiracy and told him to sign it. We didn't sign it, and he, he refused to do it, and Captain Fritz, you know, raised his hand like he was going to hit him, and, you know, Frazier jumped up and was, hey, you know, I know there's some officers outside this door, but you and I are going to have one hell of a fight, and I'm going to get a couple of good licks in. Now, is he a crazy communist? Is he like a lunatic? You know, Will Fritz looks like a pretty, you know, normal kind of happy-go-lucky guy. But when confronted with bullshit, he's going to argue it, be argumentative about it. So Oswald's going to be the same way, okay? I'd be pretty fucking arrogant. No, I didn't fucking shoot the president. What are you talking about? Are you crazy? What the hell's wrong with you people? I would be like that. But also, I'm smart enough to know that, hey... After that, I shut the fuck up. I'm taking the fifth. I want to talk to a lawyer. And I get my phone call. Where's my phone call? You know? <laughs> Where have my rights? And I wouldn't be talking to people in the fucking hallway and the news media. You know? 
Anyway. All right, so we got about uh, two more minutes. Is is this as is this as to you and and Hosty or also Captain Fritz? Did he di differentiate in conduct between Captain Fritz and the two of you? Now, no, that would apply to everyone present. Did he answer all questions put to him, or did he refuse to answer questions? No. There would be certain questions that he refused to comment about. When this happened, what um, happened was the when this happened was the question pressed, or another question asked. Anyone asking the another question would be asked. What sort of question would he refuse to answer? Was there any pattern to his refusing? Well, now I am certain, not certain whether this would apply then to the particular interview the first interview or not in answering this but I recall specifically one of the interviews viewers asking him about the selective service card which he had in the name of Heidel and he admitted that he was carrying the card but that he did not admit he wrote the name Heidel on the card and at that point stated that he refused to discuss the matter further I think generally you might say any time that you ask a question that would be pertinent to the investigation that would be the type of question he would refuse to discuss well he didn't refuse to discuss the rifle okay didn't refuse to discuss the handgun he had the the revolver but um and again if you think about it if he's on this working with the FBI or working with somebody undercover or somebody who is saying they're the FBI or, or the government or this anti-Castro group or the Birch Society or whoever he has this false ID of the selective service card okay uh, I wouldn't admit it either that's you know that's just admitting to another crime right there anyway I mean what gets me is kind of odd that you know, FBI men are acting like, oh, what? Uh, well, we asked him if he killed the president, and he said, no, I couldn't believe it. He was so arrogant and uh, argumentative about it, too. I mean, he just, he would never admit to killing the president. Can you believe that? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'm sure that's not the first time an FBI agent has heard someone or a policeman has heard someone deny that they committed a murder or committed some crime or some shit like that. So, their shocking, their shocking arrogance is kind of bizarre to me, I think. Anyway, all right, so that's enough of that one. We're going to move on and uh, go back to our spy terms here for the rest of the video. Again, hate to be boring, but you have to go through all these this shit, like I said, to find your little diamonds or find things that are odd and don't make sense okay like I made a note here let's see I wrote down that it says Oswald was arrested at 150 p.m. at the Texas theater and should have arrived at Dallas homicide by 215 but bookout says they arrived at 310 in that odd bookout said he went in there for the interview at 315 and that Oswald arrived five minutes prior so if Oswald had arrived and he was there for an hour why did Bookout say that he went in five minutes after Oswald got there okay it doesn't make any sense if Oswald's arrested at let's see he goes home at Kennedy shot at 12:30 he goes home one o'clock gets his his revolver and his jacket um, Tippett shot 108 115 Oswald is seen about 145 going into the theater without purchasing a ticket. 20 Scott squad cars show up for a person not purchasing a ticket to go into a movie theater. And he's arrested at 150. You know, he's searched, put in the police car, driven back to police headquarters. You should have got there by 215. But book out saying that he didn't get there until 310. So either book out's lying or the police were taking Oswald someplace else for 45 minutes or an hour. 
kind of odd. Kind of odd. I think that's another one of those weird things, those diamonds that sticks out. Anyway, keep going. Let's see. Uh, Elent. Electronic intelligence derived from the interception of radiation sources such as radar. Well, Oswald was a radar operator, so he knew all about that. So he was going to give all that information to the Russians, but apparently the Russians didn't really care to have that information. Anyway, Enigma, a cipher machine used by the Germans to encode messages during World War II. And, of course, I'm sure we had our own encoding machines also. And just to note, um, if you ever watch the, uh, the Americans, okay, you'll see um, at the uh, residentiary, they call it, which is the intelligence section in the embassy, they'll go into a special room, okay, and the head of the residentiary, uh, which is the head of all the missions out, out of that embassy, will dictate something to a uh, stenographer or typist that will type it into this encoding machine um, and then that'll go across the wires or however it's transmitted back to uh, the center back in Moscow okay and so they were using I'm sure the Germans got a hold of some Enigma machines and were using those to do their encoding also I'm sure we did the same thing Escort, an operations officer assigned to lead a defector along an escape route. Now, um, if you think about the JFK assassination, okay, you want to think about Jack Martin and David Ferry, okay? So, what happened with Jack Martin? So, Jack Martin was sitting across the street from his office there with Bannister uh, at the Katzenjammer um, bar which was also right downstairs from the Secret Service in New Orleans. <laughs> I'm sure there was Secret Service in there too. Um, but they're in there and they hear about Kennedy getting shot and uh, Bannister and them you know later on they got into an argument about files and he pistol whipped Jack Martin so bad that he had to go to the hospital. Jack Martin was in the hospital. The police came and gave them a report about what had happened, but didn't want to file charges with his boss. And but he did call the uh, the district attorney's office for some reason after the police left and told him about uh, David Ferry and how David Ferry had hightailed it out of New Orleans about an hour or two after the assassination okay um, or about an hour or so after the assassination and had gone to um, Houston and you know hung out at this air, hung out at this skating rink by a phone never seemed to skate but the other guys that went with him went skating but hung out by a phone there so Jack Martin mentioned that um, David Ferry was a good pilot and was probably had gone to Houston to be an escape pilot to get Oswald out of the country and fly him to Mexico. Okay? And which is, that would be an escort. Someone assigned to escort someone out. Now, there's other cases of escorts like there was an agent, uh, an archivist in the KGB. Uh, called uh, Metrican, which is, is his code name. I don't think it's his real name. But Metrican, um, so basically, you know, the KGB, just like the FBI, like we're reading through all these reports, these police reports and FBI and CIA reports, the KGB generates a lot of paper too, okay? And so when they've, they've finished or someone retires or something like that, all these papers get cleaned out and they go to an archivist and they, you know, are like like NARA, but it would be like a secret, a secret NARA, for the KGB. And Metrican worked as an archivist in this KGB archive of all these mission statements and things like that. And he had top secret clearances and things like that. So, but he also started noticing that hey, a lot of this stuff, you know, 
either was illegal, they were murdering people and stuff like that, and they were putting in reports. Um, so he wanted to defect to the out of the Soviet Union. So he started making copies and stealing archives, and he had a dacha, a country dacha out in the country, and he would put them in milk cans and bury them on the property and stuff like that. And he did this for probably five, ten years. And eventually he contacted, somehow he was able to get a hold of the uh, Americans in the West. Um, he got a hold of all these papers. They made arrangements for him to escape. Um, and so what happened is he drove to the Finnish border. Um, some agents came across in a car from Finland and uh, met him in the woods there and escorted him in the trunk back across into Finland and where he defected and gave up all his Mintrican files, which are thousands of files. And that's how they were able to find out a lot of stuff, you know, especially if the, you know, if the KGB did anything with Oswald and stuff like that. And uh, they were also able to bust a couple agents in the United States. But that would be an escort. So it's the espionage, the practice of spying or using spies to obtain secret or confidential information about the plans and activities of a foreign government or a competing company. And everybody knows that's what we're doing here. We're, we're reviewing that. Exfiltration operation, a clandestine rescue operation designed to bring a defector, refugee, or an operative and his or her family out of harm's way. Now, I just described an exfiltration operation with Mitrokin. Um, also, you know, if Oswald had been able to get out of jail somehow, uh, supposedly Ferry was to fly him to Mexico. Let's see, what else here? Expats. Citizens of one country who live in another country. Well, we all know what that is. Eyes only. Documents that are intended for the eyes of one specified person only. Now, here's the thing that people don't understand about uh, top secret clearances. You can have all the different levels of top secret clearances and stuff that you want, but if you don't have a need to know, okay, or if it's just for someone's specific eyes only, you should never see that document and will probably get prosecuted for receiving that document, even if you have clearance to see a document at that level, okay? A lot of times you'll see documents that are specifically written just for a higher-up commander, like a general, uh, someone in the, um, you know, the, the Pentagon, or even the president, prime minister, their eyes only, okay? No one else would be allowed to, to see that information. Uh, let's see, FBI, of course, the Federal Bureau of Inf Investigations, U.S. Domestic Counterintelligence Service and Federal Law Enforcement Agency. Um, let's see. Flaps and seals, the trademark involved with making super surreptitious openings and closings of envelopes, seals, and secure pouches. Closings of... Okay, so I think what they're talking about is reading the mail. Okay? So you've got, you know, Marina sending these letters out via the post office uh, to Ant KGB back in the Soviet Union. Well, before it goes out, it's already going to be flagged in Dallas by the FBI because they're going to contact the the postal service and say hey uh, we're interested in any letters uh, that you get mailed from this address here where this lady Marina is living okay or if you come across any letters coming to her we want to see them first okay and then letters that are sent to countries are sent out in you know big bags so all the mail is sorted to go to the Soviet Union. We'll go in one bag, and another one going to Finland, and another bag, and all these things. And so the the Postal Service and the FBI are going to have some kind of arrangement. Uh, they can, you know, peruse through those letters in that bag before it gets sent to the Soviet Union. Okay, 
and they're going to go through and they're going to have a list of names of people they're looking for and addresses and they're going to look at each letter and you know or if it just looks interesting they're going to open it up and you can steam these letters and loosen up the glue and open them up take pictures make photocopies nowadays and uh, you know take pictures of the envelope stuff like that and then you go back and you, you look at it you also if you they want to dust it for prints for fingerprints you know people leave fingerprints on letters and uh, they can get that and then they can check the contents of the letters to their translators they can check the addresses the names mentioned see if they show up in any of their files and stuff like that uh, there was a really good movie uh, about I don't know about 10 years ago and I it was a, it was a German movie but it was it was um, it was set in East Germany or East Berlin and it was about uh, how the Stasi you know had over 250,000 agents okay or officers and then probably within that probably a million people were being worked by those officers at least okay uh, now not all the all those 250,000 people in the Stasi were case officers okay they weren't all maybe 10 20,000 of them were maybe 50,000 of them were um, they also have their own little army uh, but a lot of those people were paper pushers they were opening envelopes listening to wiretaps stuff like that and then had case officers that would go out and develop you know like an FBI agent he would go out and develop a lead an asset you know hey we've got you on you know, arrest them bring them in set them down in front of them look they play a tape you know or they show them a photo of something you know they play them a tape of them having a conversation not even intelligence related but you know an affair with someone or their boss or whatever and then or they got a picture of them smuggling in some liquor from West Berlin or some shit like that or making a phone call to somebody and they would use that as leverage against them because you're gonna you're not gonna just get someone to appeal to their patriotic duty you're gonna use them by having something to hold over them okay this is what they would do or they sexually compromise them like they did Trump or you know something like that and they would use them and use them as an asset just like Marina was used as an asset to write back to KGB and you know go to those trade dances they would use these people and what they found out is that you know nearly everyone what 16 million people in East Germany nearly everyone had a file on them okay they were being watched by somebody whether it was a grandpa a neighbor a landlord a teacher a boss a lover or wife a husband somebody a doctor everybody was informing on everybody okay <laughs> so that's what was happening that that was the it was a intelligent surveillance state okay it, that's just the way it was and then the reason they know this is because after the East Germany collapsed they went into the Stasi headquarters and they found all these files and started going through the files and you could actually uh, make a request to go in and read your own personal file <laughs> And many people got divorced, and many people stopped having relationships with other people because they found out that they were in, they read their file and found out that they were being spied on or informed on by their teacher, by their doctor, by their spouse, <laughs> by their gardener, whatever. Because everybody was getting a hook into them, and they, you know, in order to not go to jail or to not get in trouble they were informing on people some stuff was made up completely anyway let's see floater a person used one time occasionally or even unknowingly for an intelligence operation um, well you know you'd have in Dallas you had plenty of people that would have been floaters okay 
Um, for instance, you could have had even Oswald was a floater. He was used in certain ways and didn't even know that he was part of an intelligence operation. Okay, It says, friends, general slang for members of the intelligence service, specifically British slang for members of the secret intelligence services. Um, you know, that applies in a lot of intelligence services because what they find out is that, you know, they're not able to have any kind of normal relationship. A lot of these officers, intelligence officers, are not able to have normal relationships with other people because, you know, most people talk about what they do, what they, you know, at work and their boss and all these things. And so unless you want to continuously lie to someone and then try to remember your lies about what you told them you were doing, um, they usually, a lot of these people end up being very lonely and didn't have that many friends, you know, because it was hard to confide them, hey, I'm an intelligence officer for the CIA or the, or the Mossad or the MI6 or whatever. And so they usually ended up having friends among people inside the intelligence services that they could depend on that would look on the, after their family, you know, when they went off on missions and understood what was going on and things like that. A ghoul, agent who searches obituaries and graveyards for names of the deceased for use by agents. Now, um, you know, I, I can't think of something in the JFK assassination that would uh, fit this. I'm sure there were people that were doing this, okay, but what I was thinking of was someone in the, uh, or a couple of people in that TV show, The Americans, you know, these these Russian uh, illegals that are here, well, they, they came over on false names and false passports and things like that. And basically what they did is they had someone, someone that was sympathetic to the Soviet Union or maybe even a, another illegal, would go out and look in graveyards for children that had died or people that had died in early childhood before you got a social security number um, that were born around the same within five years give or take of the same time as the person of the illegal they were trying to get in okay and once they found someone then they would go and apply for you know a birth certificate saying hey I lost my birth certificate and then they would wait until that person you know, turn 15, 16, 17, they apply for a social security card, they get a driver's license with the birth security, uh, the social security card and the birth certificate, and then boom, you're on your way. Then you get a passport, American passport, and then you're an American citizen. Okay, very, very easy to do. It's a lot more difficult in other countries. I know in Israel, it's a lot more difficult. Uh, you have a national ID. Um, in order to get that national ID, you've got to show a lot of paperwork notarized birth certificates and you know um, things like that and ketubas of your of your family your, your parents marriage and things like that um, much more difficult and then to get a driver's license is much more uh, difficult also but anyway so let's see handler a case officer who is responsible for handling agents in operations well you know uh, there'd be people that handled um, De Mornshield and handled the pains and handled Oswald. Okay, whoever Oswald was reporting back to, that would have been his handler. Okay, whoever um, Marina was writing back to Aunt KGB, that would be kind of her handler in, in kind of a sense. And also in kind of a sense that um, Oswald was being handled by, you know, Mrs. Payne and De Mornshield indirectly. Anyway, honey trap, sling for use of men or women in sexual situations to intimidate or snare others. Well, you know, Marina is definitely a honey trap. She was definitely used, okay, to get closer to Oswald to find out if he was the real deal or if he was a, if he was a, a plant, you know, someone that was sent over as a fake uh, defector. And in another sense also, you know, um, what happened with Trump is exactly the situation he fell into, according to the Steele report. And basically what the Steele reported was an MI6 agent 
who had developed all these, you know, intelligence assets inside uh, Russia, inside Russian intelligence over since the 80s, probably 40 years. And now as a private citizen, um, this group, they wanted to get uh, an intelligence report, find out any vulnerabilities to uh, Trump. So it's like this. You're not going to pay about $250,000, okay, to get harmful intelligence on your enemy, and you're not going to pay for that money unless it's true, okay? Because if it's all bullshit and can't be used, you, you're, you're not going to pay them, okay? So Steele, all he did was went back and recontacted all the intelligence assets that he had used during the last 40 years or so, okay? And they came back with the same, almost all of them came back with the same information or confirming the same information. It's highly unlikely. So if it was just a scam being run by one or two of those guys just to make some money, they wouldn't have been confirmed by the other 10 or 15 that he had been interviewing. Okay. The only prob the problem that a lot of the news media had is that, you know, he couldn't identify by name these people because if he did they would have been in danger of being eliminated by by Putin okay um, Putin's not you know Putin's not uh, not one of these kind of persons that takes lightly people exposing his agents inside the United States and you know that's what uh, that's what Trump was he was basically when he Divorced Marla Maples back in like 1999 to the point where he married Marina, uh, uh, whatever her name was, Melania. He was kind of a free agent. He dated her. He hung out with Epstein on Epstein Island. And he went to Moscow and chased after Skirt. Okay? And they knew this. They had any kind of businessmen coming to, Os uh, coming to Moscow. They're not, they're inviting them for these business trips. Okay? They're not inviting them with these free hotel rooms and free uh, meals for nothing, okay? They're wanting a return on their investment. So they offered Trump, you know, come on over. We'll check out maybe hosting the Miss, you know, Miss Universe contest over here in Moscow. Maybe get you some, you know, they're always dangling that uh, Moscow Trump uh, hotel deal. And so they're always, you know, dangling it out in front of them to get them the enticement to come over. And the FBI in New York puts out a standard lecture to big-time, you know, money men in New York City and CEOs to be very, very, very wary if they ever don't go to Moscow. And if you do and you're in a bar and you're a 50-year-old CEO of some corporation and some, you know, two 20-year-old girls come up and start hitting on you in a bar, it's not because they like your gray hair, okay? It's because they're just like Marina at those dances, trade hall dances. They're going to use this as a honey trap to entrap you, and they may not use you then, but they may pull the card out and use you later, just like Trump, okay, Trump even says it himself. He says, why would I want to run for president? I have a good thing going. I'm making two million, a couple of million dollars a year with my, uh, my TV show. Why would I want to go through all the abuse of running for president? But then he turns around, well, when he was asked about this, and then he turns around and does exactly that four or five months later. Okay, Trump was run because they had entrapped him through a, you know, um, a honey trap situation with these prostitutes and drugs and they you know was wired for sound in his hotel room and they used him and at first they used him because you know Putin um, Trump had been getting money from these oligarchs that were fleeing Russia okay and using that to finance his businesses because he'd gone bankrupt and nobody would touch him or loan him any money 
Okay, so he had these Russian oligarchs that would flee and want to launder their money to so they could have it legit in the United States. And you know, Cohen, his lawyer Cohen, goes through all all through this how it's done. They'd set up a fake corporation LLC in or um, offshore in the Virgin Islands. And then that corporation would set up an LLC with Cohen as the, you know, legal signature, unnamed LLC. They would purchase property, real estate from Trump, who would sell it an undervalued. But he'd overvalue it and then sell it at a loss, they would say. So he'd say it was worth $10 million. He'd sell it for $8 million, write off the $2 million on his taxes. That's why he hardly ever paid taxes at all. Okay. And then... After three or four years, they'd sell the property back to Trump, who would then sell it to someone else at another loss. And they just kept flipping these, you know, the same real estate buildings. You just, you're not even, you know, the management company stays the same. The tenants stay the same. All you're doing is flipping paper and making millions and writing off millions. The property stays exactly where it's at. Nothing changes inside the building the tenants stay the same the management company stays the same all you're doing is changing on paper who owns the property okay so it goes from trump to the oligarch they sit on it for two three years to sell it back to trump at a loss they write off the loss trump turns around and flips it to another oligarch they write it off as a loss for trump they write it off as a loss for the oligarch they've laundered billions of dollars by using real estate Okay, it's very very easy because once you buy that real estate, it's hard. That's hard structure right there. It's tangible. Intangible is cash. Tangible is real estate, and then you sell it for cash. Now you've it's all legit. You pay some taxes on it. It's all legit. You can do what you want with it. Well, the whole deal was Trump. They flipped Trump with the honey trap. Okay, through the intelligence services in Moscow, because Putin wanted information about these oligarchs that were leaving. He wanted to know were they building up allies in Russia to come back and run and throw him out of office? Was he? Were these guys, these oligarchs, did they have connections with people inside his military and his intelligence services to have a coup and throw him out? Okay. Trump, through Cohen and his other, all his other Russia files, you know, Michael Flynn, I mean, look at everybody involved in the Trump organization and the Trump administration are all Russians, all, all Russia files, you know, Papadopoulos, Michael Flynn, all these guys are pro Russian. Okay. They all had their, you know, Cohen's meeting. In Czechoslovakia with these guys, I mean, they're all just just a wash in Russian money, a wash, and and there's really no difference between a Russian oligarch, Russian intelligence, and Russian military, and Russian businesses. They're, you know, just flip it over and it's one or the other. Okay. Um, Trump was happy because he got money; he could write off these properties for taxes. And then they didn't expose him and things like that. So, again, why did Trump run? Because they, you know, 2016 is two years after the first invasion of Ukraine and the taking of Crimea. Okay. Putin wanted Crimea, uh, wanted Ukraine back into part of being part of Russia. Okay. He knew that if Hillary Clinton became president, it'd be more the same that happened during Obama, but worse. He had sat there and watched as he thought Hillary Clinton and the CIA was overthrowing dictator after dictator. You know, Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. They were going after his guy Assad in Syria. Okay, they had invaded Afghanistan, invaded Iraq. They'd overthrown the government in Egypt in Tunisia and Algeria so and then they threw out his ally in Ukraine 
Okay, so Putin wasn't going to sit around and wait for shit to happen. He decided to take action. They used the honey trap that they pulled. They they used the Trump card that they had gotten on Trump to the honey trap back in 2003, I believe, is when it happened. And they got Trump to run for president. And they didn't know if he was going to win or not, but they damn sure were going to try to help him. And at least caused so much chaos, which you see, what have we gotten since 2015? The last eight years? Chaos. Along with that, you've got Putin's buddy running disinformation campaigns. Uh, Putin's chef, they call it. He, runs, he also owns the Wagner Group and runs this group, the Internet Research, Research Agency. They've been putting out flooding Facebook, flooding Twitter with all this disinformation, you know, about chemical weapons and about COVID, and just everything, okay? So the Russians are really good at what they do. They're very professional, okay? They're very adaptive and can learn a lot of things, and they're not afraid to go into territory they never went into before. All right, we've gone over our time here. We're going to keep going and um, keep going through this. And I'm going to show you how things back back then, the old is still the new, and the new is still the old. And what happened in the JFK's time is happening right now, today, same terms, same intelligence services, just same game, just new people. All right, take care. Bye-bye.